We are go. Go ahead, Gary. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for those that are attending this so far. Uh, welcome. I'm Gary Adkins. I'm a volunteer and presenter with the AARP Lexington community team. I've served as a Kentucky felony prosecutor for about 18 years. And I've also worked with the Kentucky Department of Financial Institutions to help investigate and prosecute securities fraud crimes. My co-presenter today is Jeff Jacob. He's the Security Enforcement Branch Manager for the Kentucky Department of Financial Institutions. Prior to this position, he was the Director of Security and the Senior Vice President uh, for Central Bank. Uh, today, we look forward to today's conversation about fraud prevention and AARP's Fraud Watch Network. Slide. Daniel slide. Sorry, having technical, not able to change. <laughs> Let me fix that. Keep going. Well, scammers steal billions of dollars from unsuspected consumers every year. The impact on victims and their families can be financially and emotionally devastating, especially for older Americans. AARP created the Fraud Watch Network to empower consumers to spot and avoid scams and to provide support and guidance to victims and their families when fraud happens. In addition to attending sessions like this every day, you can find a wealth of resources at aarp.org backslash Fraud Watch Network. Some of you may be asking, why is AARP engaged in this? Well, you might know that AARP began about 60 years ago when its founder, retired school principal, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrus, discovered one of her former teachers living in a chicken coop. She was appalled by that this woman who had worked her whole life couldn't even afford a place to live. She founded AARP to protect the financial security of older Americans. Fighting identity, theft, and fraud is part of the core mission. Now, to help protect yourself and your loved ones today, we're going to be looking at some trends involving fraud, understanding how much fraud is out there and what it looks like, the con artist playbook to understand the strategy and tactics used by con artists to defraud. We'll talk about prevention knowing and practicing prevention strategies to avoid becoming a target. And we'll also address resources, how to access and share up-to-date tools and resources about fraud identification and prevention. And then where to go if you or someone you love has become a victim. One of the things that we'll be doing today is We'll have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. There is a question and answer spot at the bottom of your page, Q&A, and you can enter your question there and we will address the questions at the end of the session. We want to be able to learn from each other as we go through this and uh, uh, it's a judgment-free zone as we're going through all this. Slide. So because we're doing this in a virtual setting, it's difficult to know our audience. So one of the ways that we're gonna to try to uh, accomplish that is to please ask you to answer some poll questions that pop up on your screen. 
we'll give you a, a, a minute or so to ask answer those questions and then we'll go from there. First one is have you or someone you know been scammed? You'll take a moment and answer that question. The second question is, of the scams that occurred, were they reported to authorities? The third question is, scams can be short in timing or long and drawn out for several months, even years. And that's a, uh, whether it's a short length of time or a long length of time or both. Reasons for attending this webinar, there's multiple choices. What type of fraud are you most interested in learning more about? And there's multiple choices. And if someone loses money from an investment, is it always a civil matter? Poll numbers are bouncing around a little bit. Okay, we're going to end the polling. And uh, it looks like about 80% has indicated that uh, you know you have been or someone you know has been scammed. Uh, of the scams that occurred where they reported, about 40% said they were reported and 40% said that they were not reported. Scams can be short uh, in timing or long and drawn out. 40% uh, said short and length of time. Nobody said long time frame. Um, there was 60% that said it could be both or either one. Reasons for attending the webinar. Personal knowledge is 90% of the folks, 10% um, member of an agency. What types of frauds are you most interested in learning about? The highest one was the computer virus scams with a 100%. 10% uh, was interested in romance scams, 50% charity scams, 30% extortion, blackmail, something for nothing, 30%. Insurance scams, 50%. COVID-related scams, 40%. Precious metals, 10%. If someone loses money from an investment, is it always a civil matter? 10% said it was true. 50% said it was false. And 40% said they weren't sure. Thank you for answering that. Uh, I can address the, the last one first. Uh, because just because it's an investment or a scam, uh, it isn't always a civil matter uh, because in all likelihood, it is a criminal matter. Theft by deception uh, or theft involving securities, there's a statute specifically that addresses that. <clears throat> Slide.
we are going to be talking about some trends that uh, that we have with uh, some of the scams and the, uh, uh, the frauds that we've seen. Um, and based off upon the surveys that uh, I saw, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, top scams that we uh, see in the United States. Um, and I'm guessing that nearly everyone today has been either approached with a fraudulent offer, or maybe you've been a victim of identity fraud or fraud, uh, or somebody that you know has. Well, we're not all alone with that. Slide. The top three scams and frauds reported to the Federal Trade Commission through the third quarter of 2020 was identity theft, imposter scams, and online shopping. We're going to take some time in going through each one of these. Each one's closely connected to the pandemic, and we'll talk about why as we move forward. Source for this uh, is through the public tabloid um, through the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, the FTC includes telephone and mobile devices and it's reporting, uh, but it's mostly complaints about phone service providers and business practices, which we don't define as fraud, so we'll leave that out. Uh, and usually it's coming in the, among the top three complaints. Slide. So what's identity theft? Identity theft is when someone steals your personal information, like your name, your social security number, and bank account information. Identity theft becomes identity fraud when a criminal uses that information to steal money. Now, identity fraud can include opening credit accounts in your name, racking up thousands of dollars of debt. It can mean a scammer draining your bank account or applying for government benefits in your name. Identity fraud can even involve filing bogus tax returns. It's not surprising. Identity fraud is a multi-billion dollar industry. U.S. consumers and financial institutions lost $16.9 billion to identify to identity fraud in 2019. That's up 15% over 2018. Now, during the pandemic and economic downturn, we learned a lot a million dollars being hijacked involving un unemployment benefits. Thieves would use stolen, stolen identities to file for unemployment benefits, directing the payment to themselves. Eventually, the victims of the identity theft fraud get a letter confirming their benefits, and that's when they learn, and the state unemployment agency learns that they've been defrauded. Slide. Imposter scams. Imposter scams involve criminals impersonating someone to coerce targets into giving them money. These criminal impersonate federal and government employees, sheriffs, tech support workers, even our family and friends. The Federal Trade Commission reports that Americans lost $498 million to imposter scams through the third quarter of 2020. We know that scams and fraud are underreported, so the losses are likely very much higher. The primary approach typically starts with a robocall or a live call. In a robocall, the re recipient is warned of a bad situation that they must call back to address immediately. Most often, it's someone saying that they're from Social Security Administration and they see suspicious activities happening with your social security number. And if you don't call them back, the given number immediately, you'll face arrest. Another common imposter scam is a grandparent scam, where the target gets a frantic call from someone claiming to be a grandchild or the grandchild's attorney. And they need your help right away to get them out of some sort of mess that they're in. Usually it's a, a ruse for bail money. Uh, he was in a friend's car and they got pulled over and the police found drugs and now he needs you to bail him out. Or she was in a terrible accident and the person or the other car 
uh, and the other car is pregnant and there's critical condition. So the granddaughter is being held for reckless endangerment and needs the money right away. The target is told to wire money or purchase gift cards and read the account number and pin off the back. And as soon as they get the money that it's wired or shared via the gift card, it vanishes. During the pandemic, criminals have posed as Medicare, calling to offer beneficiaries free COVID tests. Their goal, to steal the Medicare numbers and falsely bill billions and millions in bogus claims to Medicare. They pose as IRS calling for your bank information to process your stimul stimulus payment. Uh, they even set up fake testing sites to collect cash or Medicare numbers for administering fake tests. We continue to get these calls about warranties on your auto uh, and various other things. Anymore, I just answer those unknown numbers that I see as Sheriff's Department Fraud Division. May I help you? That usually terminates the call fairly quick. Slide. Okay, we've covered the top three scams happening across the U.S. in 2020. So let's move on and cover several others. Slide. Stand by, Gary. Okay. First one we're going to talk about is investment fraud. And uh, Jeff will be talking a little bit more about that later in the presentation. The, the picture that you see is Steve. He was about 58 years old with a graduate degree and made his living as a successful stockbroker. He lost $40,000 in a fraudulent oil and gas investment out of Dallas, Texas. A common means of con artists committing investment fraud is through free lunch seminars. The scammer invites a bunch of people to a seminar and then presents an unbeatable investment opportunity. You have to sign up right then and there. You can't sign up later because the presenter is leaving town in two hours. So it's your money that goes with the presenter. Of course, this isn't to say that all free lunch seminars are potential scams. There are many legitimate businesses that use this tactic in offering a free meal to present a sales pitch to a captive audience. However, we urge you to be wary and employ healthy skepticism. Free launches aren't happening so much these days because of COVID, but criminals are finding ways to target people. You may get phone calls, emails, text messages. You could see an advertisement online or on TV and radio to call now for a once in a lifetime investment opportunity. A massive investment scam was uncovered in Washington state in the period following the arrest of Bernie Madoff in New York for the biggest investment fraud scam on record. Over the course of several years, Darren Berg cheated hundreds of investors out of more than $100 million through Meridian Group, the company he ran in Seattle. Berg spent money on cars, yachts, a waterfront mansion with a full-time staff. He flew between there and his home in California on one of his two private jets. One of Berg's victims was a retired U.S. attorney who specialized in prosecuting people accused of investment fraud schemes. Berg was serving an 18-year prison sentence in the federal penitentiary when one morning guards found him missing. Berg is still on the run. He's out there. Slide. Gary. Yep. So let me interject on the uh, free lunch programs. Absolutely. Uh, uh, just want to be uh, cautious. Even legitimate um, companies will um, offer free lunches or free dinners, as Gary mentioned. But they will never tell you that you're going to get a guaranteed return on your investment. Unless it's an insurance product, legitimate investment advisors that are following the law will never tell you that you're gonna get a guaranteed return. If they do, you wanna be careful and you can report that to DFI. 
So just be cautious, even with legitimate companies that you know are in town. Amen. Lottery scams. Lottery and fake prize scams are, are extremely common and they reap millions of dollars from unsuspected targets. Just through the third quarter of 2020, reports from the Federal Trade Commission came in at nearly $99 million. And we know that all scams and frauds are underreported, so the losses are likely quite higher. The ruse is to get the target excited that they supposedly won some huge switch stakes. Then the criminal string the victim along requiring continuous payments of taxes and upfront fees. Jean was one such victim. She received a call from a man telling her that she'd won $7.9 million in a Jamaican lottery. All she had to do was to pay the taxes to collect. Over a six month period, this man called Jean hundreds of times and convinced her to wire over $30,000 in quote, taxes and processing fees to Jamaica. It's hard for us to understand how this could happen. And we'll talk later about why scammers are so successful and, and hint, it's not the victim's fault that these things happen. It's the scammer. Slide. Tech support. <clears throat> Another common fraud is uh, the tech support scam. This scam commonly originates in another country or from a bustling call center. We can start in a variety of ways. Typically, the target gets a call from someone impersonating Microsoft or some other big tech company, claiming they've identified a virus on your computer or device. Often, the target may see a, a pop-up on their screen with a warning that something is wrong with their device and to call the toll-free number immediately. The ultimate objective of the theft is to convince the target to allow them to remotely access the target's device. What this does is allows the thief to do things like uploading software that harvests your credentials or to convince the target, you, that the virus must be fixed immediately for a fee. Some thieves are so uh, audacious that they, they will sell the victim a bogus subscription for some sort of tech support service. Now these tech support scams are among the most common and they occur year round. At, at my home, we've received calls from Microsoft saying that there was a problem with our computer, but Microsoft doesn't do that. Slide. With the stimulus payments that we have uh, during the first round of the economic impact payments, uh, scammers jumped at the chance to get some of that money for themselves. At this time, we're in the third round of stimulus that includes direct payments to certain individuals. So you need to be on the alert for any kind of offer to help you receive your stimulus payment quickly any requests for your bank account, social security number, or other financial information. It could come as a phone call, it could come as a text, an email, or even something through the social media. They might claim to be with a reputable company or a government agency like the IRS, Treasury, or Social Security. Slide. You can protect yourself by ignoring those contacts from anyone claiming to be able to help you with your payment. Don't share your bank account number or social security number. Get your stimulus information directly from the IRS at irs.gov, G-O-V. Pay careful attention to trusted sources on whether you may be eligible for payments and follow the guidance on how the payments will be made. Slide. Health and testing. 
we've seen a, a, just a multitude of scams on the health front. No surprise there because COVID is such a health threat, but we've seen deceptive advertising and sales of unproven products claiming to be effective in preventing and treating COVID. Tens of thousands of COVID-related websites that were set up by con artists to sell products or harvest data from individuals visiting the sites. Criminals who were setting up fake drive-up test sites, wearing healthcare gear, fake ID badges, and taking nasal swabs. They were charging cash or collecting Medicare or other health insurance information to either sell or to submit fake bills. Callers impersonating Medicare saying you have to take home tests that they will send, and if you don't, you'll be dropped from Medicare. These criminals would send targets home tests, have them submit them to a crooked or even entirely fictitious lab, and then bill Medicare for thousands of dollars per test. Slide. Again, some ways to protect yourself is when a cure or a vaccine comes about, which we have already, you're not going to learn about these things on an online ad or a phone or ignore offers for cures and vaccines because we're getting vaccines now through the state and through agencies and health departments. You don't have to go uh, just because someone is saying that they have a, uh, a special vaccine in some tent uh, someplace. Uh, that does not look legitimate. Scare tactics are intended to do just that, scare you into making a quick decision. Engage your inner skeptic. Don't give your Medicare number or other sensitive information to someone you don't know who contact you. Slide. Charity scams often take advantage of national disasters or tragedies and tug at your heartstrings patriotism and emotions, and the pandemic is no exception. These scams require you to act quickly and to use high pressure tactics that will convince you to make, take quick action. Sometimes scammers use names of well-known charities or are very similar to or try to receive, uh, deceive their donors about what they're doing. And that's part of their scam. Slide. To protect yourself, seek out known organizations to make your donations. Be skeptical of fundraising, contacting you directly. Do your research. Check out charitynavigator.org or give.org. Those are two sites that can help you to determine the outright fake charities from the legitimate ones. And you can read information on how much of the charity's donations actually go to the core focus of that charity. Never make a donation with cash, a gift card, or wire transfers. Credit cards, not de debit cards, are the safest. Consider writing down a list of your favorite causes and charities that you'll support in the upcoming year. It's easy to decline donating by saying you have a plan for the year, but if they'd like you to reconsider a donation in the following year, provide you with some information about their charity. Slide. Stuck at home scams. The scammers know that many of us are stuck at home and they customize their scams to capitalize on this. They offer sanitized home or businesses uh, from the uh, virus. They even conduct air duct repairs and cleaning. They want access to your home and payment up front. There's also the romance scams. Folks are bored or they're lonely. You don't have to be on a dating site to be targeted by a romance scam. Many of these scams originate on social media sites and applications. Ignore and report any requests for money, goods, or personal information. Puppy scams. People looking for companionship 
might be vulnerable to fake websites and paying in advance for a puppy that doesn't even exist. Slide. So only accept assistance from family members, neighbors, or friends that you trust, that you know, or organizations that you've checked out as both legitimate and who take appropriate safety precautions. Avoid answering calls from numbers you don't recognize. As I said earlier, a lot of times I will answer calls that, that I don't recognize the number and I will say, Sheriff's Office, Fraud Division, may I help you? If you do pick up that call, don't engage with them. Only connect with people that you know on social media sites and applications. Never send money or goods to someone you don't know. Develop a refusal script to end conversations that make you suspicious or uncomfortable. Even simply saying, no thank you, and hanging up. That works. Slide. Employment scams. With such high employment rates, scammers are looking to lure job seekers into their traps. Avoid opportunities that sound any way out of the normal. Be particularly skeptical of work from home opportunities, car swap schemes, and jobs that sound just too good to be true. Loan scams, debt con consolidation scams, offers, with an economic downturn and people out of work, more people are looking for financial assistance. Scammers will be hunting for those in need. Seek financial assistance from trusted sources and avoid unsolicited offers. There's also extortion and blackmail scams. Scammers will contact you and claim to have evidence of illicit activity by you or your spouse, such as visiting adult websites. They will share with you a password that you may have used in the past and are still using. They threaten to share the evidence on your social media until you pay them, usually by Bitcoin. Know that these scammers don't have access to your device. They may have a password because they bought it along with thousands of others following a data breach. To be safe, Change your passwords regularly and use a unique password for each account and report extortion emails to the Fair Trade Commission. Dot government, GOV, backslash complaint. Slide. So in general, protect your personal and financial information. Let your voicemail or answer machine help you to screen calls. If you do recognize the number and answer, be aware that phone numbers can be spoofed. Scammers can use technology to make it look like they're calling from a trusted number or a local number, for example. Do your research. Actively seek reputable information from trusted sources without trending scams, and fraud. Engage your inner skeptic when considering offers coming your way or threats to act quickly. And share your story. If you're targeted by a victim or victimized by a scam, tell others so they can avoid the scam themselves. Report scams. Report them to the FTC. Report them to law enforcement. Uh, and we have some other resources at the end of the presentation that we will address with you. Slide. And I'll hand this over to Jeff. You're muted. It appears that you're muted, Jeff. There we go. There I think I'm good now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so let's see how these criminal scammers succeed. When we look at a scam after the fact, it's hard to imagine how we would be a victim of something so obvious. 
But the reality is these criminals are sophisticated and typically are part of an organized crime ring with money, access to tools of the trade. When you think about the power imbalance, it's easy to understand why they are so successful. So let's look inside what we call the con artist playbook. Slide, please. Where did these insights come from? The two key sources that the AARP use for understanding how fraud works have been from jailhouse interviews with convicted con artists and analysis of hundreds of undercover audio tapes that AARP received from law enforcement. Next slide. Meet a con man, Jimmy from New York. His name's Jimmy Edwards. And he's kind of a star among the scammers, having worked in over 30 of what are called boiler rooms over an eight year period. These are offices that scammers use to call potential targets. Jimmy claims to have taken in $60 million. His specialty was business opportunity scams. In his interview, he described how skilled fraudsters like him will stop at nothing to reach their goal of getting your money. Next slide. The scammer's secret they call is ether. When authorities ask convicted con artists to describe how they convince people to part with their money, they all say the same thing, get them under the ether. So what is ether? Ether is a heightened emotional state that makes it hard to think clearly and make rational decisions. Scammers know that once they target, once they're target out of their logical mind and into an emotional state, they've won. As we get older, the part of our brain that controls critical thinking and emotions deteriorates as part of the normal aging process. So you don't need to have dementia to fall for these scams. Next slide. We're gonna go over some of the persuasion tactics that these criminals use. They have a wide range of persuasion tactics. AARP listened to all those audio tapes and coded them to see which persuasive tactics were used most by car artists. We've come up with five common tactics. Next slide. The first is phantom riches. Phantom riches are something you really want and become excited about. Scammers will dangle the possibility of wealth in front of their targets. A car artist named Jeremy sold overpriced coins to seniors. He describes the use of phantom riches this way. We would tell people that gold would absolutely double in value in the next one to two years and that the prospect would be able to rely on it, making them far more money than any other investment vehicle. The Florida lottery is up 30 million this Saturday night as one phantom rich scheme said. If you join our club, we will give, uh, you'll have 4,800 tickets and that's only, that's 4,800 chances to win. But you have to ask yourself a question. Did you enter this lottery? When it comes to lottery and winnings, never pay for anything to receive your money. Tell them to take any fees or taxes out of your winnings if you truly want it. We had a case, uh, it's actually a nationwide case, but we had many victims in Kentucky that were selling overpriced coins to seniors. And in this case, they targeted elderly people, typically with Christian backgrounds, conservative views, and didn't like big government. And all of a sudden, when they received phone calls, the person on the other end of the line was conservative, was Christian, and was against big government. Luring the victims into a relationship that they felt comfortable with the person on the other end of the phone. Next slide. <clears throat> we call that profiling. 
scammers would develop a victim profile by asking a series of personal questions so he or she can find your emotional trigger. If you don't mind, how long has your husband been deceased? Or let me ask you something. It sounds like you have a wonderful home there. How much is that mortgage each month? Once they know what is your emotional trigger, they know which tactics will work. Here's how Jimmy described the con artist's use of profiling to scam people. The con gar gathers an arsenal of information by being personable, being friendly. They are making notes. Two children, one with mental illness, one brother lost in Vietnam. They're using all that information to put together their arsenal and profile the person that they are on the phone with. So they know which buttons to push to bring the emotion up in that person. Steven described another con artist. What I try to do when I have a victim on the phone is to try to find their emotional Achilles heel. And once I do, it enables me to use their weaknesses against them. Romance scams, friendship scams are the hardest to stop because they can go on for months, gaining the victim's confidence. They find victims that are lonely. They find victims they want to help someone. And you might ask, well, how do they find me? Well, most scammers find their victims on the internet. If you hear, listen in the news, you'll find and, and hear about all kinds of retail companies being hacked, retail security breaches. It's amazing the amount of information a retail company stores about their customers. Name, address, phone number, social security number in cases if they have a credit card, date of birth, zip code, where they like to shop. And when scammers hack into these retail establishments, they're not always after just their credit cards because those lists are valuable on the internet so that scammers can find other victims. Next slide. Scarcity is another persuasive active. <clears throat> we, on, we only have four units left on this investment offer, so you need to make a decision soon or you'll miss out. There are only 24 hours left before this offer will expire, so you have to act now. How many of you have seen going out of business sales that seem to last forever? Or one day only sales that happen every other week? Scarcity sells because it taps into our evolutionary fear of running out of food and water. When you think there's a limited supply of something, you rush to get it. So the con artist will paint a picture that what they have to offer is rare and only available for a limited time. We have seen this throughout the pandemic, especially with regard to personal protective equipment, household cleaners, even toilet paper. When you run across one of these scarcity scams, just remember someone will always be willing to take your money. You don't have to give it to them right away. Ask yourself, why am I the lucky one? You just might be the one of a hundred calls or a thousand emails that that criminal sent out. They blast out calls and emails to a list they have through these security breaches that I mentioned and hope that someone takes the bait. Next slide. Source credibility. Con artists often try to build credibility by using a well-known celebrity, appearing successful, claiming affiliation with a reputable organization or touting a special credential or experience. Common source credibility scams include IRS, social security imposter scams, during COVID, scammers also have been impersonating the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization. Many times we call this affinity fraud. They target a certain group of people 
and they say that they are backed by celebrities. That precious metal case I was talking about used names like Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly. They targeted, again, Christian conservative against big government. Charity scams often, often, excuse me, charity scams often target liberal helping people that need a charity, uh, helping people that are poor and that are needy. Where do they get this information from? Well, look on your webpage, look on your Facebook. What do you tell the world about yourself on your Facebook page? That's all the inform information they need to target someone that they're looking for. Next slide. Fear and intimidation. One scammer said, once I got a hold of a victim, I would never let them go. Even when they told me they were out of money, I would tell them, go borrow the money. This scare tactic to hand over the money, it's not uncommon for con artists to use threats and call targets 50 to 60 times a day. Remember the story earlier, the one about lottery fraud. Well, when the victim finally stopped answering the, her phone, the scammer left threatening voicemails on her answering machine. Why you don't want to pick up the bleeping phone, the caller would say. Pick up the bleeping phone when I'm calling you and stop playing games with me. Want me to come over there and set your house on fire? Remember, if they start threatening you, these are the same people that have been talking to you for months saying how much money they need to come visit you or that they're, you've won an international lottery, which is obviously out of the country. But if you're truly concerned, call your local police. Gary, I think it's back to you. You're on mute, Gary. The same problem you had. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so let's look at some things that uh, you can do to protect yourself from scams. Slide. Avoid making financial decisions in a heightened emotional state, that ether that Jeff was talking about. Do your research, only donate to charities uh, that you already know and trust, or only if you research the charity to make sure the money going to a good cause that you care about. If someone's trying to get you to invest your money with them, look them up. If they aren't registered, they're not legitimate. Be mindful that scammers are adept at using robocalls, email, text, and even social media posts in convincing ways. Don't rely upon caller ID to verify who's calling. Let your calls go to voicemail or your answering machine. You can call back the people you know and trust. Be mindful that scammers will send fake emails and texts to try to get you to click on a link or to share sensitive personal information. Engage your inner skeptic before responding or reacting. Develop that refusal script to stop unwanted interactions. It's a great way to enter in the, in the conversation. Simply saying no thank you is a, and hanging up is a useful script. Slide. Some additional ideas and resources. Only share your social security number and other sensitive personal information with those that you know and trust or who need it for a specific reason. Don't share the information with someone who contacts you out of the blue. Shred sensitive information. I know we hear about those data breaches that Jeff talked about, I mentioned, where our sensitive information is exposed, but there's still dumpsters, divers out there who are looking for account statements and the like so that they can commit identity fraud. Review your financial statements carefully. Contact your creditors if a bill doesn't arrive when expected or includes charges that you don't recognize. 
consider banking with your financial institution online or with their app if they have one. That way you can look at your transactions whenever you want. You don't have to set up, uh, you can set up alerts if you want to, to notify you of account activity. You might want to consider placing a free fraud alert on your credit report. This makes it a requirement that a lender must ensure that you are the one requesting a loan or opening a credit card on your account. Simply contact one of the three major credit reporting agencies, request a fraud alert, and that agency will communicate with the other two. You will have to lift it to take out credit, but you can place the fraud alert back on after you complete the transaction. The three credit uh, agencies are TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. The fraud alert would expire after one year, at which time you can always renew it. Also, you're entitled to one free credit report each year from each credit bureau. You can get your free report by going to annual, A-N-N-U-A-L, credit, C-R-E-D-I-T, report, R-E-P-O-R-T, Dot com or call 1-877-322-8228. Slide. Some additional ways to protect yourself is to keep your device's operating system updated. Always install updates when you're prompted to, as the new version may replace a version that criminals could exploit. That goes for your device's security, such as a firewall, antivirus software, and anti-malware. Make sure you're running these programs and keeping them current. Protect your passwords. Don't share them with anyone. And if you write them down, store them safely. Use a unique password for each online account that you have. I, I know it's hard to do, but if a scammer cracks one password, that you use on multiple sites, they have access to all those accounts. You might wanna consider a password manager. That's a tool that creates and safely stores unique passwords for all your accounts. You can look up information online to find one that may meet your needs. Slide. The AARP Fraud Watch Network is a great resource to keep on the latest scams. You can visit aarp.org backslash Fraud Watch Network for news and information. You can sign up for scam alerts and to tune in to a hit podcast called AARP's The Perfect Scam. It's an award-winning show that takes you into the inner workings of scams and how they work. If you want to report a scam, Find out if something is real or fake or to help you with a loved one who has fallen victim to a scam, we invite you to call the free AARP Fraud Watch Network hotline or helpline where you can connect with trained fraud specialists. That number is 877-908-3300. You don't have to be an AARP member or be of a certain age to call that number. Slide. So in conclusion, you've learned some good information today about the kinds of scams going on and ways that you can protect yourself. We reviewed trends and scams and frauds. We've gotten inside the mind of a scammer with the con artist playbook. We discussed common persuasion tactics scammers use, and we provided tips and resources so that you can protect yourself from fraud and scams. To continue your learning on this topic, make sure you check out the AARP Broad Watch Network. If you learned something new today, please share it with your circle of friends and family to help protect them. And remember, if you can spot a scam, you can stop a scam. Slide. We hope that you'll stay connected with AARP. Here are some other learning opportunities that you may be 
slide and interested in uh, that's uh, coming up uh, in the near future. Also, for those that uh, have subscribed and have been on this, we will be sending you a survey in the next uh, few days so that you can provide some feedback on the presentation. Slide. Here's some resources that we have in Kentucky and, uh, and beyond uh, that can help you with some of these issues. The Attorney General's Office for Consumer Protection, the uh, Department of Financial Institutions have a uh, hotline, the DFI complaint, uh, that's the Department of Financial Institutions, have a complaint form that's online that you can complete. Uh, there's resources for seniors through the Department of Financial Institutions, the North American Securities Administrators Association, investor education fraud uh, has some of the top investor threats that they've seen in North America. The Kentucky Adult Protective Services, uh, if you have someone who is um, needs protection uh, because they're being taken advantage of, uh, you can report that, and uh, the Kentucky uh, Protective Services can take a look at that and investigate it. Slide. You can keep in touch with AARP through these uh, this information, phone number, email, website. Uh, we are on Facebook and on Twitter. And with that, I uh, want to thank you for joining us, and we'll open it up for some Brief questions. Is there any questions that anyone has? There's information in the chat box that has some of the uh, sites that uh, we've talked about. And if there aren't any questions, then I want to thank you for participating with us today. I want to give special thanks to uh, Morris Sammons, who is with our uh, Lexington AARP team, who's uh, helping with us. Uh, Daniel Rowe, who is a, a, a deputy uh, uh, state director, and Scott, uh, who was also with us, who have been helping in the background. Uh, other, other than that, I want to thank you for attending today with us, and uh, we will close our session. Hope to hear from you. Hey, Gary, Daniel here. Yes. Uh, looks like we do have a hand raised um, from Linda okay. as a uh, participant. Um, and Linda, if you are able to type in the chat um, your question, please um, go ahead and do so at this time, either in the chat or the Q&A, um, and we'll be glad to see if we can answer that for you. Okay, I don't, I don't know if um, Linda is still in the webinar, but Linda, you're welcome to chat there. Um, looks like she has uh, left the webinar. So is there anybody else have a, a question? You can type in the chat briefly uh, before we wrap up here. Looks like we do have a um, a comment from uh, uh, Dr. Mary Lynn Moran Smith. She says, I keep getting a call from scam risk and I don't answer um, who they are. 
or who are they? She, she says, I don't answer, who are they? It's a scam risk. Can you, can you all explain a little bit about that notification you get from that, those types of calls? Yeah, I've seen that uh, on, my, uh, on my phone. Uh, one of the things that uh, some of the telephone uh, services provide, uh, AT&T, Verizon, uh, Spectrum, or, or Spectrum, or uh, some of the other Sprint, uh, provide information to their uh, their their clients that if there's a number that appears to be something that could be a scam, it will show up on your phone as scam risk, and uh, and that's just to give you an indication that it's it's not a number that is one that is that you would probably know uh, that it's from a location uh, or a call number that has been connected to a scam at some point. So it's just giving you a warning about that and you may not want to answer the phone. Jeff, have you seen anything with this? Definitely. Yep, same thing. Um, they call it different things on different networks. Um, I think uh, I've seen some on mine, it says uh, potential spam. Yes. Uh, but it works both the same way. It's just warning you um, heads, you know, you may not want to answer it, or if you do answer it, be cautious of what the people are telling you. That's right. Got a comment from Shirley Cook saying good information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, briefly, Gary and Jeff, um, if you receive a call from a number, an unidentified number, would you recommend answering that right away or just letting it go to voicemail? I would typically let it go to voicemail so that you can review it. Um, you know, depending on a person's personality, if you answer that call, you may be running into a, a, a criminal who um, who's going to... Um, trap you into doing something that you don't want to do. You know, there's some people out that they, they just can't say no. They think it's rude to say no. They think it's rude to hang up on someone while they're talking. Um, so it's just best not to answer it. Let it go to voicemail and kind of screen your calls that way. Yeah, Very most good. of the time when I get uh, those type of calls, it's not a number that I recognize but I may be expecting a number from or call from someone, uh, I may go ahead and answer it. And uh, like I said, I would answer with uh, uh, sheriff's office, fraud uh, division may help you. And if it is a legitimate call, they're going to say something that would indicate it that's from whoever it was that you might be expecting a call from. Um, I got a call like that uh, that I was expecting from a local uh, provider uh, where my truck was in the shop and uh, it wasn't them. Uh, instead, it was somebody who was trying to engage in some sort, I don't know if it was a car warranty or, or what it was, but uh, I said that and the, uh, the woman who answered the phone or who was on the other line ended up saying that they uh, starting the spill again. And I said, uh, ma'am, this is a sheriff's office. Is this a fraudulent call? And the, the woman kind of giggled and hung up on me. So it may have been a fraudulent call. Consumers also need to uh, realize that uh, these scammers are spoofing telephone numbers. You know, it used to be able to look and say, oh, this is an area code, you know, that I'm not familiar with. Well, now they'll use your own area code and a, um, a, a just a fake number that they're calling from, hoping that you'll say, oh, this is a local number. I'm going to answer it. And a lot of times the numbers, because they're spoofed, uh, they may be a, a number that is a number that you recognize. Yeah, I've gotten calls from my own number before. Yeah. They spoofed the number that they're calling. So it looks like you're calling yourself. But 
And one thing you can do on phone numbers that you reach is Google it. Believe me, you are not the first person that's going to re receive a call from the from this number. You're not the only one that they're scamming or attempting to scam. So go to Google, put that number in, and you'll probably get more information than you uh, than you want to learn about that phone number. And that is probably a, a spam or a, a fraudulent call. Or you'll get a comeback that it's a legitimate company, and you can call them back. Very good, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much, um, Gary Adkins, Jeff Jacob, for um, hosting our facilitating our Fraud Watch Basics presentation today. With that, um, I believe we will wrap up and end our webinar. Thank you all so much to our participants for joining, and thank you from AARP Kentucky. Thank you.